So often we feel like we do lose ourselves. A lot of women, and I would say myself included, you might have moments of it or days of it, but I don't. It's very difficult to to feel secure. I mean, 2020. Can we get a <laughs> refund on 2020? Right. I don't know where to fill yeah. out that paperwork yeah. or where to submit yeah. that. Everyone and welcome to the Christy Wright Show. I'm so excited because today we are talking about how to get back to you. Yeah, we can lose ourselves in our own lives and we're gonna talk about how to get back to you. And then I get to sit down with my good friend and amazing Bible teacher, Christy McClellan. Christy has impacted my life in more ways than I can even count and I can't wait for you to get to hear from her. But first, let's talk about how to get back to you. I don't know if you've felt like this before, but sometimes I feel like I lose myself. (laughs) Like in the day-to-day grind of fixing lunches and changing diapers and running and rushing and errands and dry cleaning and meetings and appointments and commitments and calendars, where am I? I I just sometimes stop and take a deep breath and go like, is this who I am? Is this all that I am? Just a a, a person that checks boxes on my to-do list, a person that is a a ride to soccer or a warm meal on the table. I, I run and rush and I feel like the pace of life is so fast that I wonder who I am. I wonder where I am in my own life. You know, just this last weekend, I got to go to a wedding reception for my sister in law and they had a DJ, and when everybody was finished eating dinner and cake, people started to go on the dance floor. And I went out there with my little five-year-old Carter and my little four-year-old Conley and danced. Y'all, I haven't danced, as embarrassing as this is to say, I haven't danced, like really just danced for fun at a wedding or a party in years. I thought, there you are. You love to dance. I love to dance. And even though I was twirling my little kids around and breaking my back as Conley tried to climb on my head on the dance floor, I remembered a part of myself that I felt like I'd lost, or at least forgotten. A part of myself that I love. You know, I think it's so easy to get so busy with life that life becomes business. Hey, have you got the kids? Have you got the dry cleaning? Who's fixing dinner? What time are you coming home? Have you got this? I've got that. You've got this. I've got that. I've got this. You got that. And that is our life. And it's tiring. And it's not a lot of fun sometimes. And we feel like the spark, the passions, the joy, the fun that makes us who we are gets lost. And what I hear from women again and again and again, and I feel it myself, is I just want to get back to me. I just want to get back to myself. I want to get back to that girl that I was, the girl that I used to be before life got so stinking busy. I want to get back to her. And so I'm so excited because today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how to get back to you. You know, when this, this message was, was really pressed on my heart about a year ago, I felt the Lord prompting me to speak on this message, to write on this message. This was the whole heart and vision behind my new devotional living true. It's, it's how to get back to you, how to get back to me. And I remember sitting one day in prayer and I just asked God, okay, God, what do I need to know to get back to me? If I'm gonna help women get back to themselves, what do they need to know? And I felt the Lord show me four things. If you wanna get back to you, you need to know four things. You need to know who God is, who you are, where you are, and where you're going. You need to first know who God is and what he says about himself and his word. You need to know who you are and what he says about you and his word. You need to know where you are in your season of life, and yes, those seasons change, And you need to know where you're going and what he says about you and your future in his word. If you know these four things, if you can reset and refocus on these four things, you can get back to you. You can get back to the truth of who you are. So today, we're gonna start with the first one. We're gonna start by talking about who God is. Now, 
I don't know about you, but one of the things I've noticed about myself is I am always on the go. Are you like this? Like, y'all, I am always rushing and running from one thing to the next. It seems like I'm always carrying like 15 bags. Why do I need 15 bags? Why do I need so many, so many drinks? I've got coffee, I've got water. Does someone have a Coke somewhere they can just carry along with me? Like, I've got a million things at one time. I have noticed that I am multitasking all the time. I am putting on lipstick while scrambling eggs. I am rubbing in my foundation while throwing laundry in. And inevitably, one of the things that I'm always trying to multitask is makeup, right? Like I'm trying to do this while finishing other activities, but I never get it done. So here's what I do. I take my makeup, I throw it in my purse, and I figure, you know, I'm just gonna finish it when I get there. My hair getting caught in my purse bag is a real struggle every day. I'm just gonna finish it when I get there. But here's what happens. I get to wherever I'm going, and I pull out the little compact to finish my powder, and I open it up to look at the tiny mirror to see what I need to do, and I can't see anything. Can you see anything in that? No. Because it's been tossed and turned, the powder is everywhere, it's a huge mess, the image is blurry. I can't see myself, and I can't see what I'm doing. And you know what? This is what it's like when we try to understand who we are without first understanding who God is. It's like looking in a clouded mirror. You can't know you. You can't get back to you if you don't first have a clear image of who God is. If you can't see yourself as a reflection of the God of the universe that loves you and created you, it's like looking in a clouded mirror. It's like having a blurry reflection. We're going, I'm trying to wipe off the powder going, who am I? So if you're gonna get back to you, you need to first know who God is. You need to have an accurate image of him. And that is an accurate image that can only be gotten from the truth in his word, what he says about himself, the things that he chose to tell you about himself in his word. I love how it talks about this in Genesis. In Genesis 1, 27, it says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. He created them, male and female. He created them. He created you in his image. And when you try to figure out who you are apart from God, you're gonna hit a dead end. When you try to figure out who you are without having an accurate picture of God, it's like looking in a blurry mirror. You can't see yourself and you can't see what you're doing. Now, I don't know if your image of God got blurry when you were growing up. Maybe a tragedy happened. Maybe something heartbreaking or horrific happened. And you think, how could God be good if he let that happen, and that distorted your ideas about God. He's not a loving father that's near you. Maybe he's a critical taskmaster that's pointing fingers and placing blame and keeping a score and a report card of you and your performance. He's a God that maybe pulls out the rug out from underneath you because you have wounds and pain from your past and your childhood. It's created a blurry image of God for you. Maybe your image of God got blurry when you just had a lot of different competing theologies thrown at you and pushed at you all throughout growing up, maybe even in adulthood. So many competing opinions and perspectives and and different denominations and different uh, angles, different theologies. Maybe that has created a blurry image of God for you. You're like, I don't know who God is. They say he's this and they say he's that and they say you can do this and they say you definitely can't do that. Who is God? I don't know. Maybe you don't have much of an image of God at all. Maybe the whole idea of God just seems really kind of crazy and foreign and weird. So your image of God isn't just blurry, it's non-existent. Regardless of how your image of God got distorted or blurry or messy over the years. You can never get back to you until you understand the one that created you. You can never know yourself until you know the one that you were created as an image of. So if you wanna get back to you, you need to start with knowing who God is. 
Getting to know who God is by the truth in his word. And here's the thing. God wants you to know him. He's not playing hide and seek. He's not playing hard to get. He wants you to know who he is. And he tells you who he is in his word and in your life as he shows up for you again and again and again. God's word says he is faithful. He is good. He is a creator. He knows everything. He can do anything. He's always on time. He made you and he doesn't make mistakes. His grace is unending. His mercies are new every morning. That is who God is. So I don't care what someone said when you were in middle school, what someone did to you in adulthood. That is the truth of who God is. And that is a truth you can build your life on. And that is the truth that is gonna help you get back to you. All right, y'all, I'm so excited to tell you about my brand new devotional called Living True 40 Days to Get Back to You. This is going to be the devotional that's gonna help you break through the busyness of life and feel like yourself again. I wanna help you build the confidence you need to be the person you wanna be. And we're gonna talk about exactly what we've been talking about recently, who God is, who you are, where you are, and where you're going. And when you remember those four things and you build your life on the truth in God's word, you can get back to you. You can get your copy of Living True, 40 Days to Get Back to You at christywright.com slash devotional. All right, y'all, I'm so excited because I get to hang out with my real life great friend and brilliant Bible teacher, Christy McClellan. Christy, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I feel like we should be doing this over sushi. I know, I was just gonna say, (laughs) wild ginger. Like, that's where we normally hang out, and so that's where all of our conversations are. This is fun, because even though it's a set and it's office and all that, I'm just so excited because every time I get to have a conversation with you, it feels like we've been friends forever, even though we've just been hanging out recently. Mm -hmm. But it's also one of those things where it always centers on God's Word. But I'm just so grateful for your friendship. And I know for anybody that's watching that doesn't know who you are, tell us a little bit about your story and what brought you to Nashville and what you do. Well, originally I'm from rural Mississippi, um, so I know how to drive a tractor barefoot (laughs) if you ever need that skill set. Uh, But accepted Christ when I was nine years old. And one of the changes um, that my parents actually recognized in me early on was just this insane curiosity for the Bible. And that has just traveled with me the entire time that I've known the Lord and been walking with Him. And when I was 16 years old, I was walking down the hallway at my church and my youth pastor stopped me. And he said, Christy, I want to ask you a question. And I said, okay. And I don't know if he was asking all of the kids this or if it was just a divine moment. But he looked at me and he said, what is it that you would do all day, every day, for the rest of your life for free? Just a small question for a 16-year-old. Just a tiny little question. No 16-year-old is trying to figure that out. (laughs) And, you know, I'm just trying to figure out who am I hanging out with Friday night. Sure, sure. But I heard myself say I would teach people the Word of God. Wow. And that moment is such a gift for me Mm -hmm. because I was a young girl in a world where girls could not teach Bible Mm -hmm. and were not supposed to teach Bible. And so how do you burn for something you can't have and that you can't do? That seems impossible. Right. Um, And so, you know, Did it feel weird to say, real quick, did it feel weird to say that out loud, to hear yourself say that? To hear me, well, it was a moment of calling. It was almost like the Lord used my own voice to show me my calling and my purpose, the plumb line of my life and that right. somehow in some way I would as a female touch the scriptures know the scriptures be able to teach the scriptures sit in the scriptures with people um, long before I ever was actually able to to walk into those things in those spaces so 16 was a big year for me and went on to college my undergrads in biology because again girls can't teach bible mm. so I'll go be a physical therapist sure. and God was like nice try <laughs> yeah I mean way to go Um, And then just throughout the years, for the past 15 years, I've been teaching Bible at Williamson College here in town. In 2007, the Lord opened up the door for me to go study the Bible in Egypt and Israel. And I tell people all the time, I went to Israel and learned that God is better than I ever knew. Mm -hmm. And I came home just wrecked, Christy. I mean, wonderfully, if you can be wrecked in the best kind of a way, the living God met me in that incarnational space where he just took on— flesh and came down. 
And it, it's still changing me 13 years later. So for the past 13 years, I really feel like my function, my calling, people call me a professor, they call me a Bible teacher, but I am a bridge yeah. between the Western church and the worlds and the lands of the Bible. Yeah. And so for the past 13 years, I've been serving as a biblical culturalist, mm. and I teach the Bible through its original historical, cultural, linguistic, and geographic context. I've been taking teams to Israel for the last 13 years. Yep. I'm a visual learner. I need to see it, touch it, taste it, eat it. And um, it feels great. I'm 46 years old, and I feel so absolutely centered mm. that I am doing and being, living and breathing exactly what the living God wants me to do. Mm. What a and gift. there's such a shalom in that. Yeah. It's, a, it's more than peace. It, there's yeah. such a shalom. I love the the stories that you've told me, even just when we've had sushi and hung out. And I remember you telling me about this trip in 2007 because you went to seminary. You have the the education, the experience, mm-hmm. the knowledge of Scripture. But the way that you talk about that trip in 2007 and how God is better than you ever knew. And you even did, like, when we were at sushi, you did, you're like, I'm a bridge. And you did, like, a visual <laughs> of the bridge. So I was like, got it, you're a bridge. But it's like, I love how visual you teach. But what's so cool about it is— you have a way of not just understanding that for yourself, if God is better than you ever knew, you have a way of transferring that to people. And you have to me and mentoring me. Mm-hmm. I know you do through all of the women that you teach and through your Bible studies and your and your preaching and teaching. So I wanna I wanna kind of camp on this idea for a second mm-hmm. because as I've been trying to walk through this in my own life and help women understand, okay, if we're so often we feel like we do lose ourselves. A lot of mm-hmm. women, and I, I would say myself included, you might have moments of it or days of it, but I don't it, it's very difficult to to feel secure like you just described mm-hmm. and like I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing and this feels so centered and and at peace. And so I love as I walk this out in my own life, helping women mm-hmm. get back to themselves. That's what I hear them say all the time, Christy. They're like, I just want to get back to me. Mm-hmm. I just want to get back to mm-hmm. me. And there's practical ways of that, tactical ways of that. There's also like a, there's a a spiritual aspect of that. And I, where I always want to take them to start for them, that the people that I help and also myself is you can't know who you are if you don't first know who God is. You don't know the one that created you. If you want to get back to you, Mm -hmm. then you need to know the one that created you to begin with. So I want to, I want to camp on this idea of who God is and what he tells us about himself and his word, what he tells us about um, the the different attributes of him. And one of the things that you have taught me as going back to the cultural lens mm-hmm. is we as a Western culture read the Bible so differently mm-hmm. than, than how it was originally written. We're re- you even talked about like the part of our brain when we read left to right, how we're picking apart and it was written to be put together as a story. So talk to us a little bit about scripture and the love story of the Bible and what God wants us to know about himself. Maybe some things we know and maybe some things we are missing or or misunderstanding. I'm about to come off the couch. I'm I'm so excited to talk about this. So I tell people all the time, the Bible was given to us that we might know who God is, what he's like, and what it is to walk with Mm -hmm. him. And when I talk about that God is better than I ever knew and that that was something that just, that I learned again and anew in Israel, it's the idea of here in the West, as a Western culture, we are infinitely more Rome and Athens than we are Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. We are more Greco-Roman. I was gonna say, unpack that, explain what that means. Yeah, Yeah, so we're more Greco-Roman as a culture. And so we're more Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato than we are Jesus, Peter, Paul as a people. And so when we read the Bible, sometimes we read it and we lead out with the question, what does this teach me about me? We wanna go right to application. What am I supposed to do with this? But in the Middle East, they ask a different question. They don't ask, what does this teach me about me? they lead out with, what does this teach me about God? Mm. And I tell people all the time, how many of you know if you stare at yourself too long, you'll get depressed? (laughs) I mean, (laughs) you know, but when we read the Bible and we begin with God, who are you? What is this showing me about who you are and what you're like? Staring at ourselves may take us one direction, but staring at the living God it brings transformation. Mm. It provokes us unto all righteousness. It quickens us. It centers us. It aligns us. And so I tell my students all the time, we never actually just read the Bible. We interact with it. 
It is living and active, and so are we. And so the rabbis of Israel talk about when any human being sits down with the scriptures, it is life with life, which produces lahaim, like the good life, the marrow of life. Wow. And so there's this invitation in the very fact that God gave us a Bible. It's one of the ways that he is showing himself, that he's revealing himself. And so when we open it up, this idea that you were talking about, sometimes women, we lose ourselves. Mm-hmm. What's going on? All of a sudden, I'm blinking and it's Thursday. I thought it was Monday. Yeah. You know, life I'm running comes errands. so quickly. I, yeah. You know, am I on top of everything? Right. You know, am I dropping balls? All of this. For me, when I sit down with the scriptures, I really think the first step is always to pray. Mm-hmm. And it's to posture ourselves to receive what it is that the living God has for us. Yeah. Because too often, even for us who are reading our Bibles, it becomes a thing to do. I need to have my morning quiet time yeah. so that I can check it rather than really viewing it like the living God of the universe is getting ready to meet with me yeah. in this moment. Yeah. And He is here and I am here and I am reading what He has written about who He is and it sets me on fire. Mm. It, it's a it, completely different posture. You approach it with the way that you describe that yes. because I think so often we do approach even our quiet time, our scripture, looking at it from the lens of what does this say about me? What am I supposed to do? Mm-hmm. You're more of a consumer. I love one of your your favorite one of my favorite lines of something you say is the way that was intentionally written was you stare at God and glance at yourself. We stare at ourselves and glance at God. It's like it's supposed to be flipped and it changes everything mm-hmm. about how you read the word, but even how it transforms you when you're fixated on him and realize it's a story about him, not about us. So I love I love that idea. As you're as you teach this and as you're helping people understand the cultural context and how to read it, what do you think are the attributes or qualities or aspects of God that we misunderstand? Or we, it's like, we're just so busy. We're like, okay, he loves us. He's, you know, we kind of check these boxes, like you said. Mm-hmm. What are some things that's like for us to sit in? He's the, I love how you, I noticed this about you, Christy. You almost never, that I can think of, refer to God as just God. It's always the living God, Mm -hmm. the living God. It's like you're reminding people he's the living God. You're meeting with the living God. Mm -hmm. What are some other aspects or words that you put to go, you know what, we've got to remember this if we're going to know who he is. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind when you ask that, and it's a little bit back to the differentiations of West and Middle East, but we have a famous story in the Bible. I don't care what denomination you grew up in. If you didn't even grow up in church, you've at least heard of this story. And here we call it the parable of the prodigal. Son. Mm-hmm. It's found in Luke 15 yeah. in the Gospels. And what's so interesting is in the Middle East, they do not call it that. It is called something different. And I remember studying in Israel and a rabbi beginning to unpack this. And he goes, today we're going to talk about the parable of the running father. And I thought, I've never read the parable of the running father. Where is yeah. that in the Bible? New story. Who knew? And it's Luke 15. And so now we're back to when we read the Bible and ask, what does it teach me about me? Yeah. We find our, we locate ourselves in that story as the prodigal son, the sure. older son, sure. whichever one. But in the Middle East, no, who is God? He's the running father. Wow. He's the father who runs for his son mm-hmm. who's gone to the far country, yeah. who is lost. And when you go read that story, uh, <laughs> I mean, I could start crying, but the Bible is adamant that God is doing the work and he's going to finish the work, that there is a deep and profound restoration and renewal of Mm. all things. Mm. That every day, even when you and I are asleep at night, when the Bible talks about God does not sleep, the living God does not slumber, he is working like yeast into dough. Mm. This profound, like turning things right side up. He's not afraid to be in a fallen world. And so when you ask me, what are those attributes? When I think about the living God, you know, one of my self-care rhythms is I'm a morning person. If I'm not up before the sun comes up, my whole day is gone. Yeah. I like to wake up and it's dark outside. And my little dog, Chester, we get our coffee and we go out <laughs> on a walk. And, you know, every morning of my life when I'm walking in the dark, just me, the living God, and my dog, I'm like, Lord, you are the running father for me today. Because so often it's like, man, if I'm feeling disheveled or if I'm out there, how do I get home? 
And I think that the Bible is telling a very different story. Wow. It's when we realize that we're lost, He's the running Father who is coming for us to bring us home. Mm. And that's a very different story. Right. You know, um, when you think about sheep in the Middle East, during my study time there, we followed a shepherd with his sheep all day, just observing, yeah. because it's the greatest metaphor in the Bible yeah. for God and us. And something that was just so beautiful and, and wrecking of my heart was when a sheep recognizes that it is separated from the fold and lost, it does not start trying to figure out how to get back. It hunkers down and it starts crying out. Wow. Hunkers down and starts crying out to be found. Mm. And it's the good that shepherd like, oh, yeah. who searches for the lost sheep until he finds it. This is Luke 15. And when he finds it, will he not put it on his shoulders yeah. and carry it home? The hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that the living God is running for us and he is relentless in the run and he will run until he finds us and he will put us on his shoulders and he will bring us home. Mm -hmm. And that is the story of the Bible. That is the hopefulness that we have in Jesus. We are a people being found and carried home. Mm. We don't have to figure it all out. Mm. That Even that right there is not only so countercultural, it's almost like it's that feeling that th the emotion that rises up with me, even as you describe that visual, is like, oh, it feels too good to be true. You know what I mean? It's like, it's almost like it's, it's like the grace, like when it really sinks in your spirit, you're going, oh, Lord, that just feels like too much for me to even handle. And I think what's so beautiful about this reminder that you're talking about is we're such a culture of doing. Like, okay, I just need to have better goals. <laughs> I need to have a more efficient to-do list. Mm -hmm. I need a new app. Is there an app for the running God? Are the running fathers are like an app? Like, we're such doers, and, and I'm certainly one of those women that's like a, a go-getter, an achiever, or type A. But when you realize that when you come to the end of yourself, because you will, because I will, oh, yeah. because we all do, um, and 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 we want to get back to ourselves that it's not about doing, mm -hmm. that He will come for us. I love how you said... He is a God that does the work. Because, mm -hmm. gosh, Christy, we feel like, well, if I've lost myself, I need to do more to get back to myself. I need to achieve more or be more efficient or manage my calendar better. And I just love how you're flipping not only the story of the prodigal son on its head. Of, this is not the story about the son and what he did or didn't do. It's about the story of the father. He's the subject of the sentence. He's the yes. hero of the story that he, he runs. It's his action that the story is about that as a story of our life, that as a story of women that are feeling lost, mm -hmm. um, not just maybe even separated from God in some way or, or their faith, but women that are going like, I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. My life isn't like I thought. My dreams um, didn't come fulfilled. Mm -hmm. I've been disappointed. What can I do more to get back to who I am or, or what I'm about? And I love this reminder that you're going, oh no, he's a God that does the mm -hmm. work. The, the the sheep, oh, that got me, Christy, yeah. like the visual, the sheep hunkering down mm -hmm. and, crying and crying out. out. If you want to get back to you, if you want to get mm -hmm. back to who God created you to be, hunker down and cry out. And God is that Father mm -hmm. that will run to you. And He will. I mean, my prayers have changed the last 13 years because uh, I'm an only child. I'm a two on the Enneagram, yeah. <laughs> and I'm OCD, yeah. which I think is a spiritual gift, but it's not in the Bible. Yeah. Um, and so I I can get really sideways when I feel out of control, because mm. uh, being an only child, my toys were exactly where I left them. Like uh, Everything yeah, should yeah. be exactly right, yeah. as I left it. Right. And, you know, I used to pray a lot, you know, God, help me figure this out. You know, help me. What am I supposed to do? In the last 13 years since studying Inezhal, I'm like, you know what, Lord, come find me. Just come find me. Yeah. And wisdom finds us. Wow. You know, there's a phrase in the Old Testament that we see over and over, and it goes like this, and the word of the Lord came upon, and the word of the Lord came to, mm. and the word of the Lord came upon, and the word of the Lord came to. We don't have to open up our Bibles and dig something out to feed ourselves. The word is living. It is active. Breath of God, spirit of God, person of the living God coming for us. Mm. And so I really do think that there's something to posturing ourselves like daughters. We are not orphans. We are not the fatherless. Yeah. We are not here alone. He really is with us, and He's taking us somewhere, and He is going to see it through to the yeah. end. How would you encourage someone that 
they might understand some of that intellectually. They mm-hmm. will say they grew up in the church. They know that God is good. They know that God loves them. They know that God is for them. All, all the things that we know <clears throat> that the, the word tells us about God, about himself. But their situation is anything but that. Mm-hmm. And they want to know that God runs for them, but they don't feel God's mm-hmm. presence. Presence. They they want to know that God is good, but their situation doesn't feel good. Mm-hmm. And they're in that place of going, okay, God, I know you say this. I know this is the truth in your word, but my situation is this, and it feels so different than what you say. How do you encourage women to reset, refocus, mm-hmm. recenter on the truth of his word when their situation is anything but that. And we have so many examples in scripture of yeah. of that and yeah. the disciples going through that. But for some reason, when it's us, it's way harder mm-hmm. than understanding someone else going through a hard time when we're going through that mm-hmm. and, and the situation is so hard, we just want to find an emergency exit. We just want God to fix it. We want it to be over with. And sometimes we're sitting in this hard time and and it's really hard to remember that God is good. Mm-hmm. How do you How do you encourage people in that place? You know, and the first thing that comes to my mind is when I read the Bible, God does some of His best work in the desert. Mm. I've heard you talk about this. We're talking about that. Talk about that. I love it when you teach on this. In the wilderness, you know, when you think about the book of Exodus, Exodus is all about deliverance. The Israelites have been slaves in Egypt. And what's so interesting is in one night, God miraculously delivers the Israelites from Egypt. He parts the Red Sea. I love that the Bible says the living God vigilantly watched over them all night as they passed through the sea, like a father just hovering, watching, and waiting. So in one night, he delivers the Israelite out of Egypt, but it would take 40 years in the desert to get Egypt out of the Israelite. Wow. And so when we think about the 40 years of the wilderness wanderings, the the desert wanderings, we have this idea given by the living God of a tabernacle. God doesn't say, you know what, guys, you're going to be in the desert. You're going to be in the wilderness for 40 years, and I'm going to be transcendent and up here and out here, and I hope it all works out for you. Canaan is that way. You know, I'll give you a map. He says, no, build me a tabernacle. Build me a dwelling. Build me a tent. I want to live with and among you. And so back to who is God. He is the one in our wilderness seasons who tabernacles with us. He is here with and among us. And, you know, back to some differentiations between West and Middle East. Typically, when we speak of a wilderness, if I'm like, Chrissy, how are you doing, girl? And you're like, I am in a wilderness. (laughs) You mean, I just want to get out. You know, when we find ourselves in wilderness seasons, it's what got me here. What did I do wrong? How long, oh Lord? What is my action plan? (laughs) Where's the exit? What do I need to do to get out? And the Hebrew people, the Israelite people, they view the wilderness so differently because it's actually the place where you go to get your word from the Lord. Mm -hmm. The word, word in Hebrew is devar. And the word for wilderness is midbar. So there's a phrase that the rabbis use of when you wake up in a wilderness, and we all have, I mean, 2020, can we get a (laughs) refund on 2020? I don't know where to fill out that paperwork (laughs) or where to submit that. But I mean, the world has been in something of a wilderness this 2020 year with COVID and everything else going on. But for the Israelites, oh, we're in a wilderness. They ask a different question. It's not, what did I do to get here? Where's the exit? How long, oh Lord? How do I get out? They ask the question, okay, Lord, what is my devar in the midbar? What is my word in the wilderness? Mm -hmm. And it's almost back to that sheep with the hunkering down and crying out. They really view the wilderness as a place where God meets his people, where he gives his word, um, which ends up being wisdom and instruction and strategy and comfort and goals and, you know, all of that. And so it's just a place of of union Mm -hmm. and communion with the living God. And so, you know, just back to my last 13 years, you know, this year has been hard for me in all honesty. I am homesick. I miss home, and by home, I mean Jerusalem. Yeah. I feel more like myself when I'm in 
in Israel than I ever do here. Yeah. But, you know, I'm still trying to like figure out church clothes yeah. and <laughs> Mac makeup and, you know, I'm just in a brand new world. New things are coming for me, new opportunities. I'm scared. I'm intimidated. I'm insecure. I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord, what is going on? I just want to go to Jerusalem and eat a falafel yeah. on a corner somewhere. <laughs> I know that world. I yeah. know that world. You know, can I please just get get back to life as I know it? And, you know, five Israel trips this year, none of them are going to make. And so it's been a lot of loss. Mm -hmm. And it's been really disorienting for the only child, OCD, mm -hmm. who really likes to live with my ducks in a row. Right. And sometimes I think God and His great love just frustrates that a little bit because um, we really are bent on doing things that are within our wingspan, within my capacity. You know, I really think so often I miss out on what God has for me because I keep trying to measure it against what I know I can do mm. versus what He wants to do, maybe in me, for me, through me. Mm. And it's in those wilderness seasons. So this year, if you could read my journal, it's just a lot of me trying to scribe the Devars in the Midbar, the Word, mm. the words that He's giving me in this wilderness season. Because I 2020 feels like a wilderness for yeah, me. Yeah. Um, I am not a happy camper. A lot of times this year, I told a friend the other day, I feel like I'm living my life with my flag at half mass. Yeah. Um, and I'm, so I'm like, God, your timing is wrong. I don't know if you tell God he's wrong. But sometimes <laughs> I'm like, know? Lord, um, your timing you. <laughs> is wrong because my flag's at half mass. I'm not at full strength. I don't fully feel like myself. I'm disoriented. I'm insecure. I'm fearful. All this stuff is going on. And then all of these unprecedented opportunities are coming. And I'm like, Lord, no, just wait till I'm strong again. Yeah. Wait till my flag's at full. You know, wait. Right. No, no, no. You don't want me right now. <laughs> I'm a little shaky right now, yeah. you know? my road rage is kind of yeah. flaring up right now yeah. when I'm driving through town. But it is that word in the wilderness. It's yeah. that His word does not just live on mountaintops. Mm. He speaks in the valleys and yeah. He speaks in the low and He tabernacles with us. Yeah. So to just know that in our lowest of lows, we are not alone. Mm. He is running he is coming. Yeah. He is tabernacling. Yeah. He is dwelling mm. with us. And just as he led the Israelites out of the desert, he's going to lead us out of our wilderness seasons. I'm going to go back to Israel, Lord willing, one day. Mm. And, you know, I'm going to know that joy again and that shalom, and I'm going to get to experience it with a team, but it's not for right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's just amazing how I feel like just the encouragement you've given us of who he is and how he meets us, that right there is for so many people that are watching right now that are feeling like, that was me. I was trying to find an emergency exit. And you're going, oh no, hunker down. And the yeah. word, the Devar and the Midbar, yes. I love that. Just looking for the word in the wilderness of what he has for you right now. And maybe this is a tough time. Maybe it's just a tough day. Maybe it's been a tough two years, you know, for some people. But uh, just this reminder of who God is, that he is with us. He runs to us. Mm -hmm. And um that right there is one of those things that regardless of what we're facing, knowing we're not alone, even if we feel like we are knowing, no, God is one that tabernacles with That's us. Right. And so I love that. Christy, I could talk to you all day. You're, <laughs> and we do, actually. Yes. We will go to sushi soon and yes. we will continue this. Yes. Um, but for anybody watching that wants to connect with you and just see what all you're up to, social media, I'd love it if you'd let them know where they can find you. For sure. NewlandsBiblicalStudies.com. And I'm at Christy McClellan on Instagram. And I think I've got Twitter and some other things, yeah. but I don't know. Yeah, Instagram mainly. Yeah, and then there the, we go. The, what was the website for the studies? NewLensBiblicalStudies.com. NewLensBiblical. And I'm going through her Jesus and Women study right now, and it's so, so good. Christy, you're amazing. Thank you for being here. Thanks for sharing hope and reminding us who God is. Thanks for being here. Thank you. All right, y'all, I wanna tell you about a new resource that makes screen time meaningful called Minnow. Minnow has shows that kids love with values that parents trust. And here's the cool thing. It helps my family connect with God every day of the week, not just on Sundays. And I know that I can trust the shows because Minnow has an amazing team of moms, dads, and church leaders that make sure every show is safe. You can learn more about Minnow by downloading the Minnow app, or you can go to gominnow.com. That's G O M I N N O dot com. All right, y'all, I wanna share a scripture with you that is one you may have heard before, and it's said in a different way all throughout the Bible, but this is from 2 Corinthians 6, 18. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Such a simple verse. 
but such an amazing reminder that God is not this distant, critical, unkind God in heaven, so far from you, judging you, keeping a report card of how you're doing. He is a dad. He's your dad. He loves you like a father loves a child. Now, let's just camp here for a second because that can be a good thing in your mind or it can be a bad thing in your mind. You know, so often, and and psychology actually reinforces this, research shows this, we tend to view God like we do our earthly father. Now, if we had an awesome dad and and that dad was there for us and he was present and he built us up and, and we always knew we were safe with him, well, then that's a good thing. Those qualities transfer when we think of God. We hear God as a father. Okay, cool. Yeah, I know that safety, that security, that unconditional love. I get that. And then we, of course, understand in God's word that God is so much better than our earthly father, even if our earthly father was awesome. He's a perfect father because because even the best fathers will let you down. They're not perfect. They are flawed, they are human, and they will disappoint you at some point, if not multiple times. Even the best dads will do that. So we understand that God is a perfect father, even if your father is awesome. But if he's not, or he wasn't in some way, if you have wounds there from your childhood, if you have a difficult relationship with your dad, if you have a strained history or relationship with your earthly father, then it becomes incredibly difficult to understand that your father God in heaven is good. It's really difficult to understand that your father God in heaven is good if your earthly dad was not good. It's hard for you to remember that he loves you unconditionally if your earthly dad had conditions on his love for you, if you had to perform, if you had to achieve, if you had to get straight A's, if you had to be captain of the team for him to pay attention to you, if you had to act a certain way and be a certain way and, and, and behave and perform and, and, and meet whatever expectations he had, it becomes really difficult to understand that God loves you exactly as you are in your best moments and your worst moments and every moment in between. Maybe you had a dad that was absent. He just wasn't there. Maybe through divorce, maybe he was deployed, maybe he just left. Or maybe his body was present, but he wasn't really there. It becomes really difficult to understand that God is near you. He is with you wherever you go. He will never leave you and never forsake you. And he always notices you and he's always interested in you. It's hard to remember that if you didn't experience that from your earthly dad. There's a great book by Louis Giglio called Not Forsaken about this exact topic of how God tells us that he is a good father in his word. And for some of us that have had a difficult past, if you have a wound with your dad, it it can become really hard to remember that. But I just wanna encourage you, as it reminds us in 2 Corinthians, he is a father. It says, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He's a good dad and he loves you. One of the things I learned from Louis Giglio in his book, Not Forsaken, is of all the different ways that God describes himself to us, all the different titles and names, alpha, omega, beginning, and all the different ways that he talks about himself to us, the one that he uses the most is as a father. That is the title, that is the role, that is the reference that God uses in his word more than any other He wants us to know it. He wants us to get it. He wants us to receive it. And he wants us to live in that truth that you have a good, good father. You are his son or his daughter. You are his child and he adores you. And regardless of what your relationship is like with your earthly father, your father in heaven is so far beyond anything you could imagine. He is perfect. 
I've got some questions as you journal and pray about this and consider what it means for you. Your first question is this. What is your relationship like with your earthly father? Maybe it was awesome and now it's kind of gone different directions. Maybe you've gone your separate ways and it's more strained now in adulthood. Maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it was, it was tough when you were a child or tough when you were a teenager or really hard when you went away to college, but now it's awesome. Now you're so close. Maybe it's always been tough. Maybe it's always been awesome. What is your relationship like with your earthly father? Write down your answer. All right, question number two is a follow-up to that one. How has that helped or hindered your relationship with your Heavenly Father? How has that experience helped you understand God or made it hard for you to understand God? Write down your answer. Your third question is this. What does God tell you about Himself in His Word? Open your Bible, dig around, search, Google, find scriptures and see what God says about Himself in His Word. You know what He tells you is true. You know you can depend on it and build your life on it. So if you wanna know who God really is, ask Him to tell you. What does God tell you about Himself in His Word? Write down what you find. All right, I would love to pray for us as we wrap up. God, thank you that regardless of what we've gone through and regardless of how limited our ideas and beliefs or perspective of you is, you are good. You continually pursue us. You are always present for us. You are always interested in us, that you love us. God, thank you that you are a good and perfect father, that when we feel abandoned or rejected or lost or lonely or disappointed or maybe even unsafe. You are none of those things. You are a God that is safe. You are good. You are powerful. You are for us. God, thank you that you are a good, good father and we are your child. Not because we earned it or deserve it or got enough brownie points or got enough straight A's, but because we are yours. That's the only title we need. It's the most important source of our identity, our true identity in you. You are a good father and we are yours. God, thank you for that truth. And thank you that you continually remind us of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all so much for joining me. And you can join us next week for another episode of The Christy Wright Show. Of course, as always, for more encouragement on building confidence in yourself and the God that created you, you can visit christywright.com.